think the uh, the evidence clearly indicates that he could kill without remorse and uh, at the drop of a hat, literally. Uh, he could qu kill in a premeditated manner. He could kill spontaneously, uh, and he did. I have read some of the books that said uh, that he was a paranoid psychopath, which is a joke. Uh, it, all of the Hispanic people, some of the Anglo people that were there, they all liked him. He was not a hothead until he was pushed into situations. Uh, he loved to dance. He loved to whistle. My grandfather, Eugenio Salazar, was a personal friend of Billy the Kid's. Uh, he was involved in the Lincoln County War. He was a member of the Regulators. Uh, he was shot four times in Lincoln County War. He was probably 17 years old. The legend of Billy the Kid is nothing more than a legend. He was probably a scared young man uh, that probably wasn't a great fighter, probably was weaker than most individuals, and when he had a problem, he thought he had to shoot somebody. This is how people would describe him. They either loved him like a son, or they hated him like a snake. You don't have, he doesn't have the maturity of years to, to turn into the real adult he would have become. He was still in the process of being formed. And I think that's how you get the two sides to this. On some days, the kid did one thing, and on some days, the kid did the other. Kids are changeable. They haven't fallen into all those habits and all those ruts that, as adults, we tend to, to get into. Uh, you, kids are kids partially because they're unpredictable. And the kid's manifesting that. He's happy-go-lucky. He's uh, happy with the senoritas. Uh, he uh, loves to tell jokes. And then there's the serious side. He practices with his pistol quite a bit, doesn't he? Uh, spends a lot of money on ammunition. Uh, apparently, uh, eventually becomes uh, quite good with a, a pistol and very pleased with what he can do with it. And let's face it, there is a dichotomy there. That's what makes him so eternal, is he's the all-American boy and he's a cold-blooded killer. And you can't, those don't quite fit. And that's why the good bad boy is so potent and why that story will be told again and again long after we're gone. One of the family uh, stories about Billy the Kid when he did stay at the Spring Ranch uh, is that he was a scared young man and, and they fed him and took care of him was that he wet the bed when he was there. Uh, they didn't make a big deal out of it. It, it was just uh, a, a young man that came through the, and needed a place to stay. and. But as a legend grew and he got older and more famous and supposedly killed people, uh, the family couldn't believe he was much more than a scared young man. In the Lincoln County conflict, both sides had elements of the law working for them. Dolan had Sheriff Brady and Judge Warren Bristol doing his bidding. While Tunstall could count on Justice of the Peace John Wilson and Constable Atanasio Martinez to see things from his point of view. As tensions grew between the two factions, both were arming for open warfare. At first, the two sides battled each other with complicated legal maneuvers. Attorney Alexander McSween had been retained by the Fritz family to collect the proceeds of a $10,000 life insurance policy on Emil Fritz, who had died in Stuttgart, Germany. Mac went to New York and attained the funds, but then did not turn the money over to the heirs. There's an underlying story here, which I believe was uh, definitely the catalyst that got things on the hot end of it here, and that was the, the insurance policy. And what happened there, I, I believe there was hanky-panky going on there, and I believe that the House of Murphy had, a, had good cause, or Dolan had good cause at this point to question where that money went. The family tried every way in the world to legally get it back and they used all kind of bad excuses. McSween, uh, the best lawyer excuses in the world, said it was well, uh, they couldn't uh, uh, turn the money over because Murphy and Dolan would get the money. Well, s the family says, so what? <laughs> you know, uh, whoever gets it. Maybe, maybe uh, Emil Fritz old L.G. Murphy some money, I don't know. But uh, if the family owed it to them and they got the money, they could do what they want to. But McSween refused, never turned it over. He made all kinds of excuses. My opinion of uh, Max Sween was that uh, he was in a strange country. He was obviously listening to people uh, that gave him different ideas and he was probably misled to one point and another point he might have been led in the right direction. 
he did not understand uh, the natives that were living here. To, to put McSween as a white hat and a good guy to try to hold this money back from the family because somebody else was going to use it is completely uh, irrational. It's not good logic any way you put it. So all of their big talk and, and uh, going to push the Murphy Dolan store out uh, was, was all with this money that they, that really belonged to the other side, you know. Uh, it looks like grounds for war to me of some kind, <laughs> you know, uh, legal or otherwise. Too bad it got into a, a killing type deal. James Dolan now saw an opportunity to make life quite difficult for the lawyer. Dolan convinced the Fritzes to charge McSween with the criminal offense of embezzlement and bring a civil lawsuit to recover the inheritance money. In February of 1878, a district court in Mesilla, the legal maneuvering came to a head. McSween managed to get the criminal trial postponed. However, in the civil suit, Judge Warren Bristol issued a writ of attachment against McSween's property in the amount of $10,000. Both sides headed back to Lincoln, and it was here at the Shed Ranch that James Dolan caught up with John Tunstall and tried to goad the Englishman into a gunfight. Tunstall, however, refused to resort to violence. Frustrated, Dolan raced back to Lincoln armed with the writ of attachment against McSween and arrived in town two days ahead of his rivals. Once there, Dolan had Sheriff William Brady invade McSween's home and office to inventory all of the attorney's belongings. Further, Dolan mistakenly assumed that Tunstall and McSween were partners in the store and the Rio Feliz Ranch. As such, Dolan sent Brady and his posse to the Tunstall store to seize it and to list the value of all of its contents. When Tunstall finally arrived back in Lincoln and discovered what Dolan and Brady were doing, he was livid. After thinking it over, however, the young Englishman decided the best course of action was not to retaliate. Instead, he offered no resistance until matters could be worked out legally. In early February of 1878, Sheriff Brady sent a posse to Tunstall's Rio Felice Ranch to seize the Englishman's livestock. The posse was undermanned and returned to Lincoln. The next time, Brady sent a much larger force. It was to be a major turning point in the Lincoln County War. On February 18, 1878, Sheriff William Brady sent a posse of 23 men to the Tunstall Ranch to take possession of Tunstall's livestock. Dolan henchman Billy Matthews led the posse, which included Dolan himself, as well as gunmen Billy Morton, Tom Hill, and Jesse Evans. When the posse arrived at the ranch, the only person they found there was old Godfrey Gauss, a Tunstall employee, but a non-combatant. They also discovered that earlier in the morning, Tunstall and some of his men had left for Lincoln with nine horses. A sub-posse was formed to go after Tunstall and the horses. Included in this group were Morton, Hill, and Evans. At around dusk that day, the posse caught up with Tunstall. At that time, Tunstall's hired hands, Billy the Kid and John Middleton, lagged several hundred yards behind their boss on the trail. While Dick Brewer and another man had veered off the trail to try and bag some wild turkeys they had seen. As Billy topped a divide, he spotted the posse behind them and raced off to warn his colleagues. The posse opened fire. All of Tunstall's men raced for cover at the top of a hill, leaving Tunstall alone on the trail. Morton Hill and Evans spotted the Englishman and gave chase, catching up to him about a hundred yards off the trail. On the hill, Tunstall's men heard three shots fired, then two more shots. John Tunstall was dead. A bullet in his brain and one in his chest. They also killed his horse. Morton, the leader of the group, claimed that Tunstall had fired two shots, forcing the posse to return the fire, killing Tunstall. This was the official version of events. The Tunstall murder, my grandfather, who was probably about, I, I'm not sure, 12 or 13 years old, I'll have to check the records to see, but he knew about the family problems and knew what was going on and his story I asked him when I was about the same age I says what went on and he told me he said that the family was repossessing or possessing or taking all of Tunstall and McSween's possessions to try to get money from 